Welcome to episode 136 of the Access Noise podcast. I'm Mark Miller. Thanks for listening. In this episode, I speak to Matt Bowman from The Pigeon Detectives about their new album, TV Show. If you missed the previous episode, I spoke to Johnny Lloyd and Dan White from Tribes. So check it out, and if you like the podcast, please subscribe on your favourite listening platform, give us a rating, and leave a comment. Before we begin, here's what's been happening on Access Noise this week. Is it is the latest album from indie folk singer-songwriter Ben Hard. Sam Williams gives four stars out of five to the album, which reflects in part on Hard's experience of having too many strokes. Couldn't Make It Up is one of the standout tracks, and Sam says Hard feels more artistically free and lively. Aaron Jones gets three and a half out of five for his fourth album, Chronicles of the Kid. The Seattle-born artist fuses rock, soul and blues, but some of the album's tracks fall a little short for our review. Other Side is a standout though, showing how Jones can blend styles. Full reviews of both albums are online now. We've also got new music from country pop artist Twenty. Her new single is called Bad Man. And if you felt you missed out on her Glastonbury set after she was late to the stage, Lana Del Rey has announced shows in Amsterdam, Dublin and Paris for July. Muse also head out on tour this year with support from Nova Twins. All the details at excessnoise.com. The Pigeon Detectives are back with their long-awaited new album, TV Show. In this interview... Matt Bowman talks about the return of the band, writing and recording TV show, upcoming live shows and lots more. So sit back, relax and enjoy the Access Noise podcast with Matt Bowman from The Pigeon Detectives. So hi Matt, welcome to the Access Noise podcast. Thank you for having me. So did you enjoy Glastonbury at the weekend? Did you watch any of it at all? Do you know, I did. I dipped in an hour all weekend. Um... Uh, my wife didn't get tickets this year, so she was on an absolute Glastonbury embargo. But no, I watched all the headliners, Arctic Monkeys, Guns N' Roses, Elton John. I watched some Rick Astley, Queens of the Stone Age, uh, Billy No Mates, uh, Louis Capaldi. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Really, really thought it was a, a cracking festival. Yeah, I watched most of those ones that you mentioned myself. Um, I've, I've just seen actually Louis Capaldi's... Uh... Announced that he's uh, taking a break from Turin, which I suppose is understandable after what happened at the weekend. Yeah, I mean he alluded it to it on stage, didn't he? But um, it doesn't take a, a rocket science to figure out that was coming. I think the guy just needs to uh, take some time off, take some time away from the limelight. There's no doubt he's a cracking songwriter, and you can see, or you can see from the early days how much he loves to perform. But um, when it's it's becoming that difficult just to exist on a stage. You know, you've got to put it into a bit of context and prioritise things. So, yeah, good luck to Lewis. Um, I've never met him, but I uh, follow his Instagram pretty closely. He certainly raises a smile from time to time. Yeah, yeah, he's he's good crack. And uh, and Elton John, you know, what a performance from him. You know, it has, has to be my personal favourite of the weekend. Yeah, I was with the band yesterday rehearsing and, and, and me and the bass player were both kind of remarking on how it was just hit after hit, banger after banger. You know, people are going to fixate on the fact maybe his voice isn't what it was 30 years ago, but whose would be? Um, for me, I just enjoyed the songwriting, uh, you know, the fact he was still holding a note and, and belting him out. I thought I thought it was brilliant. Really enjoyed Elton John. Yeah, I know yeah. love a good kind of fireworks show to close a festival. It's kind of, you know, a goosebump moment, isn't it? Yeah, it was fantastic. But back to you. Going back, can you remember the first band or artist that made you pay attention to the music? Um, I'd say there was, there was three, and it kind of happened in sections. So the first CD I ever owned um, was a Beatles CD, um, and I went on a student exchange to the Czech Republic, where they don't really have a legitimate music industry there. It's all bootlegged. Um, so I managed to buy these six Beatles CDs in a bootleg version, which was literally every CD every song sorry that they recorded from when they started to when they finished so my introduction to music was the entire Beatles catalog um but they weren't kind of listed under legitimate album names and stuff so I didn't know that please please me was off this album or you know um kind of Sergeant Peppers what 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 the running order of the albums were I just knew I loved the Beatles and so that was probably the first band that got me into music then Oasis came along 
and they were the first kind of band that I felt like I could own and fall in love with and go and watch live and um, you know look forward to the release of the next album. So that kind of got me excited about music, um, you know, b- being a part of something. Although we all kind of look back on the nineties now and perhaps it was a bit naff, but uh, when you were in the midst of it, you know, it was all consuming. Um, and then you had the Strokes, slash the Libertines, but mostly the Strokes, which kind of made me want to be in a band and made me think, oh, this is what I want to do as a job, or this is certainly what I want to do on the weekend with my four best mates. Um, so, yeah, I'd say those three three bands at different stages in my life got me into music, excited me and made music all-consuming, and then kind of made me want to do it myself and actually believe you know, that's what, that's what I could do as a job. Yeah, there's a great documentary um, on streaming services at the moment about the strokes are in it and the AAAs and Interpol. Very good. Oh, I've seen it. Meet me in the bathroom. Yes. Yeah, it's um, that's a lyric from a stroke song, isn't it? Meet me in yeah. the bathroom. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it, I mean, I watched that documentary and it was kind of bittersweet because it felt like, um, like it captured a, a moment in the New York scene and um, I know when we were just coming up and, you know, 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9, I felt like that existed and we were at the epicentre of that. And, you know, as you get older, you realise you pushed out onto the fringes a bit and it's it's all the other young new bands turn. And, yeah, it was it was nice watching the documentary, but it also made me, you know, a bit kind of, um, uh, I don't know, not not jealous, but, you know, those those times are gone, aren't they? You, you can't really, you can, only, you can only be young ones. So congratulations on the new album, TV show. It's an absolute belter. It's the band's first album since Broken Glances, which was released in 2016, I believe. So why the long wait and what has the band been up to in between? The, the long wait was because we 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 retired as recording artists. You know, we we had a terrible experience with the record label and the way Broken Glances was released. Um, it wasn't necessarily received well by kind of uh, the mainstream. It was quite different to anything we'd done before, uh, which made us feel a little kind of squashed as, you know, artists and try to do something different. You know, people were just wanting, um, you know, rep- repetition of 2007, 2008. So, yeah, we just decided not to make make any records anymore. You know, we essentially became a touring band, um, almost a a Pigeon Techniques covers band, you know, rolling out (laughs) the festivals, playing all the hits. And we were happy doing that. Um, You know, we got to hang out with each other um, two, three times a year for two or three weeks at a time on tour. And we got to spend the entire summer playing huge festivals. And it was almost like a nostalgic resurgence of the band. And we were happy um, doing that. And then COVID kicked in uh, and we didn't get to see each other um, you know, two of the band had babies during COVID and I didn't see them in the entire period between, you know, finding out they were pregnant and then them having six-month-old children. And we came back and uh, played some big festivals when they finally relaxed the restrictions and just getting back together, just seeing the huge crowds out there. Um, you know, it it was a, a different atmosphere coming out of COVID than it was when we went back into COVID as in people were absolutely um, gagging for music and live music and it just kind of invigorated us to to bang our heads together see if see if I had any tunes knocking about see if Ollie had any um Dave brought some really great ones to the table and we realized we don't have an album here but we certainly have um the desire to make one kind of the hunger back to work with each other again almost having it taken away from you made you realize if you have the opportunity to do this you know, it shouldn't be scoffed at. You know, it shouldn't be something you you don't appreciate. So yeah, we we made we made another record, um, probably on the back of coming out of COVID and and not wanting to ever find ourselves in a position where the opportunity was taken away from us. And because of that, when you were getting the uh, write and record uh, TV show, did you go in through you know with different ideas of what what way the album should sound and the kinds of songs you wanted to write about? Yeah, it was a nightmare. We had five different people with five different opinions, all wanting it to sound five different ways. Um, so, yeah, we had to get over that and all get on the same page, um, which was difficult. But I think once we we did have that direction and we started playing things and they were sounding good, it was it was quite easy. Um, and 
the pigeon detectives are forced to be reckoned with when we're all pulling in the same direction. When we're pulling in five different directions, you know, the wheels come off very quickly. Um, you know, we're all best mates from primary school. So when we, when we start fighting, it's, um, you know, the gloves are off. <laughs> people people move out of the way or, you know, quickly excuse themselves. But when we're all pulling in the same direction, um, yeah, it's, like I say, it's a force to be reckoned with. And on this album, uh, you know, four or five rehearsals of trying to figure out what it was we wanted to do, and then we were off. What's the meaning behind the title, TV show? Um, it, well, it's, it's a song off the album. It was actually a song Dave wrote, Fair Play to Dave. It's only taken him seven albums to bring in uh, a fully finished, concise piece of work where I don't have to do anything to the lyrics or, you know, he doesn't have to work out a guitar hook. Dave brought it in, played as it, and we were like, yeah, that's a song, Dave. Happy days. It was actually the first song we worked on that said, you know, made it onto the album. There was four or five, you know, before that, that just we didn't think were good enough. So this was like the one where we went, no, that's a tune that this, this, this is the um the anchor point for the album and we work outwards from this. Um so yeah it just felt apt to to call it TV show. You know, as I said it was the first song where we we, we found a, a direction and almost kind of a spirit for the album. When the band's writing the songs, what what do you think's most important? A great mel- a great melody or a great lyric? You know, it depends who you you're talking to. Um I I tend to work on the lyrics but Oliver will come up with an initial melody for me to find those lyrics. Oh, less so on this album, quite a few of the, the melodies I did come up with, but um, it's difficult. If you're listening to an album with your headphones on, you know, you're going to lock into the lyrics and you're going to try and find meaning in the lyrics. Uh, even if the meaning doesn't exist, you'll try and find some meaning that means something to you. But if you're in, uh, you know, a, a festival or a live show or... Um, you know, it's been, you've been blasted out at a party. Do, do you listen to the lyrics? Can you hear the lyrics? Can you can you decipher what's been said in those subtle kind of breakdowns in the verse? You can't, can you? You're following the guitar lines. You're excited by the power of the drums, uh, and you you know you scream in the melody. I'm I'm renowned for singing the wrong words to like some of the most popular songs on the planet, um, and like the rest of the band go, Matt, you know your job is singing lyrics and. Remembering the words to songs, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so why, why do you get the songs to the words to these Jimi Hendrix songs so so terribly wrong? Or why, why are you singing the Stroke songs with made up words? I'm like, I thought they were the words. So, yeah, depends depends what setting you're in. I'll say lyrics because I write them all. Ollie will say melody because that's his forte. You ever get writer's block? And if so, how, how do you how do how would you push through writer's block? I don't get writer's block. I get kind of patches of just not wanting to be creative. And if I don't want to be creative, there's no point forcing it. You know, I can't sit in a room with four people all looking at me saying, come on, write a song. So it's not writer's block as such. It's just not wanting to do it. And I'm, I've been doing it long enough to know if that's the case. Don't try and flog a dead horse. But then when I do want to do it, things come very easy. And I know it's exactly the same for Ollie. Ollie can go through massive periods of not having writer's block because he's j- just of not actually even trying to write anything because he doesn't feel motivated to or, you know, creatively in the right place to do it. So not so much writer's block, but um, certainly go through periods of not wanting to. <laughs> so not even trying. So I don't know if it is writer's block because I'm not, I'm not even trying. Well, I read that the band stayed in a flat in Liverpool during the co- recording of the album. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that was a, a bit of a mad time. You was all in the, in the same flat. Did, did you have a good time? Yeah, England were playing in the World Cup as well at the same time. We're all big football fans. So, uh, and they always seem to be playing on weird nights, like a Monday or a Tuesday or a Wednesday. So we ended up being out in Liverpool and you know tearing the town up on a Monday or a Tuesday or a Wednesday. And at our age, it's a little bit harder to get over the hangovers. So we'd be going back into the studio the next day and the producer, um, the producer actually played all the keyboards and pianos and synths on the album. Um, not that it's massively synth laden, but, you know, there's there's bits of it in there. And he'd just look at us and he'd go, right then, guys, it's a, a keyboard and synth day today, then is it? And <laughs> we'd all just be laid on the sofas, kind of hung over, some of us snoring, um, you know, junk food everywhere. And you could just hear him in the background going, do, 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 do. Um, but bless him, he was quite understanding that, you know, we were away to 
enjoy ourselves and bond as a band as much as we were to to make a record. So it was quite accommodating. How often do you get paid to go and make an album? You've got to take advantage of it, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. The album was produced by Rich Turvey. Um, I think it's the first time you've worked with him. Um, why did you choose to go with him? And and what else did he bring to the, the, the sessions apart from playing keyboards? So <clears throat> we spoke to quite a few producers. I won't name check the ones that didn't get the job because... There wasn't a bad one, you know, there wasn't a bad one in the bunch. Everybody we spoke to had their own ideas and they were all lovely people. But um, I remember Rich coming on the Zoom call and he was like, he's a Scouser, by the way, so I'm going to do my, my worst attempt at a Scouser accent. But it was like, fucking hell, lads, these are fucking right tunes. Let's just get in a room and make them fucking massive. <laughs> that was his opening pitch to us. And we were like, all right, cool, Rich, cool, Rich. So what, <laughs> how would you approach recording the drums? You go, I'll make the drums sound fucking mega. Don't you worry about that. You just fucking play them. I'll record them. And we were like, <laughs> he, backs it, he backs himself. So, yeah, I mean, straight away we could tell Rich was our kind of person. No messing, no nonsense. Um, he had a track record. He worked with Cortinas, The Wombats, um, Blossoms. So his CV spoke for himself spot for itself so just um knowing there was going to be a personality fit was the main thing for us he's about our age i think he's like a year two years younger um so yeah it was a personality fit um and we could tell he wasn't going to mess up the record because you know we were we were lucky enough to be able to go back and listen at what he'd done recently you know some <laughs> cracking albums on there well, well let's talk about some of the songs um the, fir- the first thing i we heard from the album was lovers come and lovers go it was your first song that you put out in seven years. So why did you decide to put it out as a taster for the album first? It went against all my instincts, so I didn't want to release that as a single. Um, I thought it was too similar to things people would have expected of us. Um, but sometimes you've just got to stand away from the record and take advice from the outside. The record label were adamant. The radio plugger was adamant, you know. Uh, friends and family were saying to us, "No, no, it's a, it's, it's a banger, it's a banger. It grabs all of you straight away." So that's the reason we released it. Um, and in hindsight, was it the right decision? I think, yeah, okay. It, you know, it was it was a good um, you know welcome back. You know, it was a statement of intent. Um, it had those nasty guitars that you know I, I, I do ordinarily like. Um, so yeah, it, I can't say I had much to do with the decision of releasing the song, but um, I'm glad this decision was made. I think it was a a good welcome back for the band. Dreaming of a song. Really, really enjoyed it. I love the guitars on that there. Really yeah. Enjoy enjoyed the song. What can you tell me about the genesis of that track? Well, that's my favourite song. That's the song I had to oh, come good. back with. So I had to release that as the um as the first track back. So I think I just think it shows a different side to the band. It shows a bit more kind of uh, considered musicianship. I think it shows um better songwriting, lyrically, melodically. Um yeah, I really like that song. Um, I don't like to explain lyrics too much because I think it takes away the magic of songwriting. And once you tell somebody what a song means, and that's at the end of the story, this is what this song is about, it stops them being allowed to put their own interpretation on it. But um, let's just say it's a shout out to some overly hedonistic um, experiences where perhaps. Uh, um, consumption of certain uh, intoxicating materials goes a little too far. Yeah, it's you know, yeah, it's 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 about waking up on the pavement and not really knowing what's going on the night before. And then yeah, the 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 helplessness of you know dreaming of a song that you'll never hear. I just thought it was really poetic. Um, you know, how can you dream of a song that you'll never hear? By definition, if you're dreaming of the song, you're listening to it. So it was like just like a kind of messed up juxtaposition of a lyric. Um, and as soon as I sang it, um, I saw Ollie just look across the room and just go, and that's about the biggest compliment you'll get off Ollie. Um, I could tell he was pleased with that lyric. And then the next lyric was a bitch to write. Um, I had about 15 different versions of it. So I'm dreaming of a song that I will never hear if love is lost tonight. Now I got to that point and then just the next line must have took me five weeks to write. And I kept coming into the band going, does this work? And they're going, Mah. like, okay, has anyone else got any ideas? And they'd give me their ideas. I'd be like, not really. So, um, but that happens with songs, you know, you, you write you write 90% of a song in a 40-minute period and then you can you can work on that last 10% for three weeks 
and still not feel like you've really nailed it. You've just had to finish the song. But no, I, I, I like dreaming of a song. It's really good for me to hear somebody else agree with me. Appreciate that. After a few lessons, it definitely stuck out, as well as the warning. I really like that track too. <laughs> okay, so that track um, was written in the studio. Yeah, we were we were dropping songs in the studio. We were just losing confidence in songs in the studio and just going, is this good enough? If we're having this conversation, it's probably not good enough. And then before we knew it, we looked at the list of songs. We'd come in with 12, 13 songs and we had seven. And we were suddenly going, that's not an album. That's that's just a fucking long EP. So we need we, we need we need to write something else. And Ollie said, oh, I've, got, I've got this guitar doodle, but it's just a doodle, the, you know, the, the doodling guitar at the, the start. And we we said to him, Oh, you need you need to go back to the hotel and, and finish that song. And he's uh, he's he's a prolifically lazy songwriter, Ollie. Um <laughs> prolifically lazy. I was thinking there's no chance he's finishing this in a night. Like he's going to go home, he's going to play on his phone, he's going to go for a walk, he's going to go get something to eat. And, and fair play to him, he went um, and he came back and he had a pretty fully formed song, uh, barring some clanger, clanger of a lyric here and there, um, which I fixed for him. So, yeah, that was a really weird one. It's come out of nowhere, surprised us all. Um, you know, the producer had heard all the demos, but he'd never heard that song because we'd only heard it 24 hours earlier. And we started playing it. He was like, fuck on that, lads. Another banger. Where are these coming from? And we were like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm glad you like it. So, yeah, came out of no one that, no, no way that one. Yeah, we, 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 re- we rehearsed for 18 months trying to write that record. And then you come up with a song like The Warning in the studio out of desperation because you quickly write scratching songs off your list and going, oh, you know, we don't have many songs left. Weird. Funny you could recreate that magic on tap. When you're when you're writing songs, you know where do they come from? Is there times you would sit down with a bit of paper, or is there times you'd be walking along, going to the shop, and a, a melody or a, a lyric will just come into your head? What's your method? I always um, I always finish songs off in random places, so it's very rare I'll be able to um, settle on some lyrics in a rehearsal room when everyone's working out the parts and uh, almost and. Can't really hear myself because we're using a cheap PA and a, a, with a low ceiling. Um, so I, then I'll just tend to work on on melodies and, and ideas for lyrics, subjects for lyrics, and then I'll I'll, I'll nail the lyrics on a dog walk, um, laid on the sofa with something on the telly that's just there, but I'm not really watching it. Um, car journeys, I finished so many lyrics on a car journey. Um, I just kind of zone out, get to my destination, and you know I've finished verse one, verse two in the middle eight. Um, so, yeah, I, I tend to come up with lyrics when I'm out and about and somebody will be talking to me and I'll be thinking of the the last line of the third verse in Dreaming of a Song. So, so yeah, that's, that's how I tend to do it. We always come up with the the basis for a song in the rehearsal room. You know, Ollie will usually come in with an idea or a guitar line. The lads will start jamming in. You know, I'll suddenly have some inspiration melody-wise or Ollie will have a melody but he only tends to have to start of melodies. He's 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 kind of lost a lot of confidence in his l- lyric lyrical um, ability, which is a shame because he's a great lyricist. So he'll tend to come in with the start of a verse, knowing I'll finish it off for him. But I'll but I'll, I'll lean heavily on his melody because he's so good at melodies. You know, he finds melodies where they have no right to be existing. You know, like he'll he'll, he'll take them in place. I'm like, yes, Holly. So yeah, it's it's a combination of all sorts. The rehearsal room. Um, tidbits of ideas from Molly, uh, and then just being out and about in random places, thinking of thinking of lyrics, working on lyrics. Well, the band have announced the UK tour this November. So, how much are you looking forward to getting out on the road uh, and and performing these new songs? It's always weird performing the new songs. They almost feel like they're not your songs, or that they don't exist in the set because we've been playing the other songs for 15, 16, 17 years now, and then suddenly you introduce six new songs into the, the set. You're having to think about every beat, every lyric. You know, you're having to lock into when the band are going to come out of this middle eight. Does it go, is it four bars or eight bars? And it, it, it takes a lot for them to bed in. So I'm looking forward to it because I've got utmost confidence in this, this set of songs, and I'm really looking forward to playing them to an audience. But it comes with a huge amount of trepidation that, you know, it's rhymed for a a mistake or a meltdown on stage or the band's just collapsing and going, sorry, can we start this one again? <laughs> um, so that'll keep me up 
up, up at night in the run-up to the tour. But I'm looking forward to everyone hearing them. Um, but yeah, I'll be very nervous about playing them. But I always am with new songs. It's not my first radio, so I'm sure I'll get over it. I was looking on Spotify and noticed your most streamed song is I Found Out from your 2007 album, Wait For Me. So why do you think that song still resonates with people? Um, well, it was a soundtrack to a, a film. I don't know if you're familiar with it. You look like you might be kind of similar age to myself, but it was um, a soundtrack to a film called Angus Thongs and Perfect Snogging. And it was I- that's like a generation's American Pie uh, you know, for me, the, the, the film that was out and was the most quotable at school when I was young was American Pie. But this this was the generation below us, American Pie, Angus Thongs and Perfect Snogging, and we featured heavily on that. Uh, I think I think that that bought us a you know, not bought us but gained us a whole new generation of fans based on that one song. Um, and then back on the back of that, it ended up on a lot of playlists. And yeah, I think the song was just right time, right place, a little bit of luck, but also it's. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a catchy little little bugger. Uh, I remember cat, when Catfish and the Bottle Men first came out, they said that the Pigeon Detectives and the Cribs were the two bands that inspired them. And then they came out with a single. And the opening four bars of the single is the same guitar chords with the same guitar tone strummed in the same way as the start of I Found Out. It goes... Da-na-na-na. And then when we go into... They go into something else. But for about six months, it kept coming on the radio, and I was thinking, "Fucking you know, hell, we're back on Radio One!" And then all of a sudden, it'd be Catfish and the Bottlemen. So, yeah, I just think I just think that song meant meant a lot to a lot of people. It was maybe their first introduction to guitar music, or it was the song that was popular when they were at university, or it was the song that was popular when they went on the first lads or lasses holiday abroad. So, yeah, I think it, 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 for a lot of people, it's a go-to party song, something to listen to to pick them up if they're not in a good mood or, yeah, right place, right time, and distinctly slightly over average songwriting. If I wanted to make a playlist of the top five p- the Pigeon Detective songs, what five songs should I have mm. in my playlist? Okay, so I love a song called Wolves of Broken Glances. Um, I feel like that's the best uh, vocal performance that's ever been captured of me personally. And also I love the um, the pace of the song for the Pigeon Detectives. It's a mid-paced song, but it has a load of intensity and it just comes from the way the guys have played the guitar and I've delivered the vocals. So I'd have to say Wolves. Um, I think we have to have a bit of respect for the first album and all the opportunities it gave us and everything we've managed to do and places we've managed to go off the back of that. So I'd say... I'm not sorry from the first album. Uh, and I'd probably say I found out for all the reasons we've just mentioned the first album. Something off the second album, um, I always liked Emergency as a song, um, and it's always one that the uh, the crowd get into at a festival. It's always quite a big sing back at your moment or you know one where people let flares off. So I've, I've got a lot of good memories of playing emergency to, to huge crowds. Um, then I think I'd try and pick something a little bit different. Um, uh, do you know, I always struggle remembering the names of our songs. How, how bizarre is that? Um, it's off We Met at Sea. Uh, da, 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 I have to Google it. So if you're writing them down, we've got I Found Out. I'm Not Sorry. Wolves, Emergency, and oh, do you know what? I'm, I'm going to say one of um, uh, Up Guards and Atom because we recorded it in New York. Uh, I think that's probably my favourite time ever of being in the band for two months we had in New York. Uh, New York. So that song is called Done in Secret. Who, and I, they, and I'll, I'll email you the other song uh, once I've Googled it and remembered its name. Who, that'll, they, they will go on my, on my, my playlist. Oh, happy days. Do you ever stop and think about the journey that music's taken you on? You know, do you ever look back? You know, what, looking back, you know, what would be your best memories of being in the band so far? Um, I think my favourite memories of being in the band are just before the band got big. We were all living together in a in a flat. Um, we'd all quit our jobs, so we were having our rent paid for us by the record label and by management. And you know, they were literally giving us pocket money to buy food with. But we could we could smell something was going to happen. We were playing four or five gigs a week. Um, you know, we were getting our first spin on the radio by Steve Lamack. We were 
still writing the album, but then we'd get a phone call saying, tune into BBC Radio 1, Joe Wiley's about to play, and we'd all run down to the car park and cram into a car and listen. Um, and, you know, we were going to places like London, Dublin, Nottingham, Edinburgh, and for us that was the biggest adventure ever. I mean, we've since been to places like, you know, Russia, Japan, Italy, Barcelona. You know, we, we, there's, there's not a lot of places we haven't been now, but in those early days when we'd only ever really gigged in Leeds to be going to other places... And, and it was the only time when it, it felt like it wasn't a job. Nothing depended on it other than having a good time and um, playing a great gig. You know, there was no record label looking over your shoulder. There was no social media. That, you know, if you release a song now, you get, you know, eight people saying it's a great song and two people saying this is garbage. This is the worst song I've ever heard, getting the sea. There was none of that. No social media, no Facebook. You didn't have to update your Instagram. Um, real innocent times, just spending time with each other as kind of five best mates, probably on the verge of making it. We're not, you know, we weren't idiots. We could see the the, the noise around the band, but, but hadn't not quite made it yet. So we still had that kind of excitement and what will be. But then <laughs> you're going to go places like Japan, LA, New York, Toronto, Russia, Italy. You know, then we've had amazing experience, money can't buy experiences, you know, meeting your idols like Julian Casablanca, Liam Gallagher, Paul McCartney, going to the Enemy Awards, the Vodafone Awards, XFM Awards, Q Awards, presenting uh, Stereophonics with a Lifetime Achievement Award. You know, what am I doing there presenting Stereophonics <laughs> with a Lifetime Achievement Award? Um, so, yeah, there was loads of amazing things that came after that. Uh, you know, money can't buy memories, but... Uh, yeah, in terms of what I'll remember as the best of times, it would certainly be just just before we made it. If you could go back and relive one musical moment from your career, what would it be? Um, we say this all the time. I think I think I always wish I'd made more of the Glastonbury performance we did. I wish I'd just realised in the moment that what we were doing was something special and kind of took it in, breathed it in, some photos. There's no, there's no account of the fact we played second to last on the other stage on the Sunday night at Glastonbury in front of sixty thousand people. You know, we just. Um, I think I got out of bed at six in the afternoon and we went on stage at seven o'clock at night. So you know, I had one hour to acclimatise. It was, um, yeah, it was a wasted opportunity really. And uh, other than the fact that I know we did it, I've got no evidence, no proof, no memories. So I always find, I always think that's a bit of a shame. Was it never it was filmed fun. for the BBC or anything? No. Well, I Googled it the other day when I was watching Glastonbury, actually. I was like, I've fucking done this. There must be some re- there must be some record of it somewhere. Um, and there's one BBC official video from Glastonbury, but it's us playing in the John Peel tent. Now, don't get me wrong, the tent's rammed. There's 10 people deep trying to get into the tent. We are absolutely nailing it. You know, we must have been on tour for eight months previous to that. I don't think we've ever been tighter in our life. I was watching it thinking, we, we were tight. We were tight back then. Um, but it doesn't show us on the big stage. You know, I, I couldn't track that down. Burned to be somewhere in the BBC archives, definitely. Well. Just a few more questions, Matt. For us music fans, music is the soundtrack to your memories. What song or album, when you listen to it, brings back the best memories for you? I don't listen to the Beatles a lot, but when I do, it, re- it does remind me of um, having that bootleg compilation of every song they'd ever done uh, and kind of being sat on a, a school bus, you know, sharing earphones with somebody and thinking, and thinking, what the hell is this? This is brilliant. So anything by the Beatles kind of gives me a real um, glow of nostalgia. But um, it, again, it, it's, it's the strokes. The, the reason I wanted to be in a band the reason I dressed the way I dressed for 15 years, you know, the, the reason we went to New York to record our record once budgets, you know, allowed allowed us to do that. The, the reason we strutted around in leather jackets, you know, they defined our guitar sound, they defined our, um, the way I sing. It, I, think, I think The Strokes' first album, for me, uh, changed my life forever, really. I like The Strokes. And I like a few of their albums, but I just, me personally, I think the first album's good, but I just think it's completely overrated. Yeah, sell well, it to, sell it to me. It captured a a, a moment in time. I, I suppose when you're living in Leeds, um, 
and listening to music by the Strokes, you imagine being the Strokes, strutting around New York in your leather jackets with your hoodies underneath and your skinny jeans and, and your converse. And, uh, you know, it wasn't a new sound. The Nick the Guitar Line sounds off every New York band that had come before them, Blondie, Interpol. Um, you know, you could hear the, the Pixies in there, that kind of three note. Do, 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 do. But I, I don't know, it just... I think if you were in the midst of that scene when they came along, you know, there were a breath of fresh air from bands. And this isn't a dig at the bands I'm about to mention, but at the time, all we had was Embrace, Star Sailor, the shit version of Oasis right at the end where they didn't really care. And then the Strokes came out and they weren't just plodding along and singing ballads. They were snapping guitar strings and, um, you know, throwing drums at each other and, it was rock and roll. It was glamorous. It was leather jackets. It was ripped jeans. It was, you know, hedonism and living in New York and, you know, hanging out with pretty girls in bars that don't shut till six in the morning. And that's all they sung about in the songs. All they sung about was living in New York, what it was like to live in New York, what it was like to have a night out in New York, what it was like to be in a band in New York. So it was escapism, really, if you lived in Leeds, in a village. And the bars shut after. It, it was, yeah, escapism, I think. I must give it a, a revisit and give it a few spins again. Uh, I, you, know, you know, the production on it sounds really dated. I, I went back and listened to it recently and I thought, do I love this or do I love the idea of this and the memory of this? Um, yeah, and I, I probably still haven't decided, actually. I moved on quickly because I didn't want to spoil its, its, its legacy. Which song or album is your guilty pleasure? Do you know, I put um, David Gray's White Ladder on the other day randomly. And I was thinking, the the production on this is so cheesy, but the songwriting is mega. So that very recently kind of made me think, I hope nobody finds out about this, despite me uh, confessing it on a podcast, but this is a good album. But um, for me, and all my friends know this about me, all the band know this about me, um, the first gig I ever went to was Meatloaf. Um, Sheffield Arena and he came out on a big Harley Davidson with flames coming out of the exhaust and there was a huge bat that swung over the crowd with lasers coming out of its eyes I think it's only about 9 or 10 and it, it was a memory that stuck with me forever so my guilty pleasure for 31 years now has been Meatloaf and if, I, if I'm doing jobs on the house or I'm in the car on my own you know or I'm painting the deck in you know cleaning the car Headphones on, meatloaf turned up. Um, yeah, let's crack on. Listen, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I grew up a bad out of hell. Well, that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. There you go. I, I had memories lying in bed on a Friday night, uh, trying to get to sleep when I was a kid, and my dad having a few beers, blasting bad out of hell nearly every Friday night. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, so, so. that's certainly my guilty pleasure, but um, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll be, I'll be playing a playlist in the dressing room and um. A meet, a, you know, a really non-obvious Meatloaf album track will come on and I'll know every single lyric and I'll be blasting it out and playing air guitar in the band's face and, you know, having a right good party with myself in the dressing room. We're like, Matt, this isn't even one of the fucking popular ones. How do you know all the words to these songs? I'm like, it's Meatloaf, man. It's Meatloaf. Amazing. Uh, so what's left on the musical bucket list for the Pigeon Detective? I think you have to be honest as a band and just say... We're never going to reach the dizzy heights we did um, with the success on the back of the first album. You know, we did two nights in a row at Brixton Academy. If if you told me we're going to play Brixton Academy once now, you know, it would blow my mind. So I think you just have to reset your expectations. You have to appreciate what you did and what and the opportunities you were given. Uh, don't mourn that they're not there anymore or you don't get to do those kinds of shows anymore, you know, better to have loved and lost and never loved. And I think now, as long as we're all getting on, as long as we're playing big enough gigs where we can rock up on a tour bus and, you know, we've still got a certain amount of comfort and, you know, it feels like what we're doing is special. Um, you know, as long as we're still going to festivals and people are singing the words back at us and, you know, we're not, we don't just have blank faces waiting for the, the headline band to come on, you know, as long as people are still enjoying it, we're still enjoying it. Um, I, I think I've completed my bucket list. I think we're done. Mm. Um, so now it's just about doing it for as long as it's fun, being grateful for what we had, be grateful for what we've got, and cracking on. Nice one. 
So, Matt, is there anything else coming up you would like to mention before we wrap up? Not necessarily. We've got a great summer ahead of us um, playing festivals. We've just been booked by some mad billionaire to go play uh, a wedding in Montenegro, um, which ordinarily we would not do. Uh, but the sums of money just kept going up and up and up. I think we're his wife's favourite band from when she was younger. And he got to an amount where it would have been obscene for us to say no. So, yeah, we're going to play that random wedding in Montenegro, playing Why Not Festival, um, playing a football stadium with James up in Darling, and that's a great lineup. There's James, Maximo Park, the editors, and us, and I love all of those bands, so that that's going to be a cool one. Um, the tour in November, um, and we omitted a, a Leeds date on the tour, um, which any eagle-eyed Pigeons fans will have noticed, because we've never not played a Leeds date. Um, so all I can say about that is... Uh, it obviously means there's something special in the pipeline for Leeds in 2024, which I can't name the venue yet, but I'll say it's an outdoor venue, so it's going to be it's going to be one to remember. Nice. Is that an exclusive? Uh, yeah, because I'm being told not to tell anybody and not to talk about it. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, loose lips and all that. I'll not say anything. No, no. no <laughs> Yeah, I think pe- people have got a bit, pe- people have alluded to it. People have seen that there was no Leeds date, and that you know, obviously, there's going to be a separate standalone show for that. Cool, okay, cool. Okay. Well, Matt, thanks very much for taking the time to do this. Really, really have been enjoying the album, and uh, I wish you all, all the best with it. And when it comes out, sometime at the start of July. <laughs> sometime in July. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, yeah. Thanks for the interview. Thanks for your time. Um, yeah, some good questions in there, some thinkers. Uh, I've enjoyed it, and uh, thanks for your kind words. Bye-bye.